Hello, class. We just finished some big chapters, cardiovascular system, blood pressure, ECG, bowels, anatomy, all that, and the immune system. And uh, but we move on. We move on to respiratory system next, which is, of course, related to circulatory system. Your heart's going to be moving the blood to the lungs, right? Pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins uh, to get it recharged with oxygen and dump off carbon dioxide. And I just saw a talk uh, looking at salamander eggs here in Maine. The spotted salamander eggs are green with a symbiotic algae that lives within them in the embryo. And they even persist in the adult, having this vertebrate, having a algae living with inside of it symbiotically. And um, we don't see that very often. We don't see it in any other circumstances with a symbiotic relationship in vertebrates because we have that adaptive immune system where we can uh, detect this foreign algae living within our cells would be attacked, right? Because it's, it's not self and we would attack it. But the reason kind of it slips by in the salamander is that the algae enters in the egg stage in the embryo early on <clears throat> before our adaptive immune system is really mature. So when we're sampling all the different things in our body, the algae get shuffled in there. And so we don't recognize and attack them. Salamanders don't. Uh -uh. So anyway, kind of cool relating the immune system to the symbiotic relationship uh, with an algae. But let's get on to the respiratory system. So let me share this PowerPoint. Look at it, several PowerPoints. And the labs uh, this semester are Going to be, we'll look at the anatomy, <clears throat> the lungs and the tubes and such. Uh, uh, we'll see, I, I, there's not really much. I just don't wanna fool around with uh, looking at vital capacity. Normally we would take a huge breath, <gasps> blow as hard as we can to this machine. And that's just, you know, we don't wanna be doing that in, in, with the COVID restrictions. So um, we won't do a lot of experiments with breathing, but uh, uh, we'll talk a lot about them. All right, so. First of all, um, yes, first of all, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, issue with your respiratory system, pathology issue is smoking, of course. And um, this was, smoking was thought even to be healthy and uh, cigarettes are given out to GIs in World War II as a way to keep them awake and healthy and happy. And then 1964, uh, Surgeon General's report, of course, uh, that uh, smoking is bad for you, you know, but it's been 57 years and we're still smoking so much, even though we, we, we know uh, these uh, really bad dangers. And, and of course, not just lung cancer, which, you know, jumps out of you, but um, outside the respiratory tract, those chemicals that are constantly being kept in your body from, from uh, 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 internalizing these chemicals from burning this plant uh, uh, affect all the organs in your body. And in fact, you guys know if you, someone's looking to get a, uh, some kind of surgery, if you still smoking, they won't even do the surgery because you don't heal that well. And uh, so all kinds of issues. And you can look at this uh, 2014 report, got a link to it showing, you know, all the new things we found that uh, smoking, all the negative effects. So obesity, smoking, um, some things that, uh, cause the biggest amount of morbidity and mortality in our society. And smoking is completely uh, preventable. Uh, but you can see, since the 1960s, uh, the amount of smokers has gone down. Now we're talking about less than, oh, it's 2003, yeah, less than 20% of the population. So you look at 10 people, maybe two smoke. Um, yeah, look at that. You can see originally there was a gap with men and women and that closed and then still a few more men than women smoke statistically. And sociologically, you know, you could say, why do people smoke? You know, I mean, no one picks up that cigarette and says, oh, this is delicious, right? It's horrible, right? But um, uh, when you start early, it's the it's addictive and then you just can't stop. Uh, this, we did the addiction with your brain last semester. But a couple of you know, interesting things to look at, you know, who smokes and why, et cetera. This is just looking at income, how much you make and, and whether you smoke. And again, this is older data, but you can see if you uh, make uh, more money, you're less likely to smoke than if you make less money. Yeah, interesting. And then education. Yeah. Graduates, if you gra have graduate education, you know, there's 94% chance you're not going to smoke, right? But if you have less in high school, there's more like a, uh, over 30% chance that you're a smoker. 
And it depends, yeah. And and also, like I had a girlfriend that smoked and um, never really quit. Um, but you, uh, uh, if you work as a bartender, you work in the service industry, and that's your breaks and your social circle, and so a lot of things go into you know who smokes and why. Uh, but the common theme is that if you start early with smoking, and then you get addicted and you can't get away from it. My mom who smoked, I remember she quit, you know, it was hard, so hard, oh my God, for anyone that's tried to quit smoking. But um, I asked her, uh, she hadn't smoked for over a decade. You know, I said, oh, man, you, you probably don't think about smoking anymore. You ever think about a cigarette anymore? She says, Jeff, every day. <laughs> so that amazing? I'm like, oh my God, the whole, the, the, the change it has in your brain chemistry and it, it lights up areas that give you this reward. And if you stop, you have these withdrawals and it's just a whole nicotine hor horrifically, uh, addictive substance. And looking, you know, some of the causes, the red ones were the kind of the new ones. So of course we knew lung cancer, esophageal cancer, things like that. But yeah, bladder cancer, diabetes, uh, sexual function, uh, your immune system, of course, is, is depressed if you uh, are a smoker. I think you all know that as well. And so all these things, it's just taking some, you know, thousands of chemicals in a, in a cigarette, putting it in your bloodstream. And keep administering it, you know, from when you wake up to when you sleep and among smokers, so. And even if you don't smoke, the secondhand uh, cigarette smoke uh, is also very, very dangerous, all these chemicals. And um, these bands, I mean, you guys don't know. I mean, when I, uh, well, I flew in an airplane, there's a smoking section. It was like row one through 13 and then four, row 14, there was no barrier, but you know, and then restaurants and, and bars, they said that bands were gonna like, we're gonna put every bar out of business because no, everyone wants to go and drink and smoke, you know, if they're not gonna come out, if they can't, it's okay. <laughs> Didn't go out of business, you know, um, people uh, probably help some people quit and then others just stand out in the cold and, and get their fix. Uh, but uh, especially disturbing with children. And, and uh, cause we know uh, the secondhand smoke, uh, the baby's little tiny lungs and the developing immune system that they're gonna have a chance of having asthma and, and uh, respiratory infections and ear infections, all these things go up. I mean, it's just known. So, you know, when you see someone smoking in a car with a kid, it's just, I don't know if it's illegal or not, but it's, it's definitely should be, it's definitely abuse that's preventable because, you know, your addiction shouldn't uh, affect this innocent uh, person. God, I think you're on the same page with me on this one. Um, yeah. I remember my mom uh, liked the cigarette that first, when they burn the paper, like give me a headache instantly. And, oh, well, crack the window, yeah, cracking the window, yeah. It's gonna help, but it's certainly, you know, it's not gonna stop the smoke from reaching your, your lungs. And then I put a, last year I put a, a slide about electronic cigarettes and vaping. And the answer is we, there's a lot of unknowns, it's just so new. Um, but the ones, I mean, it's another way to administer nicotine, so um, when, uh, Companies, they, they lose business. They, all the major tobacco companies went, went with an e-cigarette too. Uh, beginning more obviously just, uh, it's just geared towards young people. A lot of you, you know, and younger, you know, looking in high school and even junior high, um, just trying to get them, them hooked on this product so they can keep making money on this. And um, even when the tobacco companies lost money in the US because smoking is going down, we exported it, you know, other places. So some of the, largest smoking numbers in the world are in Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia. American tobacco companies were make, they may put their money now towards a foreign market because less Americans are smoking, but um, yeah. Anyway, so um, is vaping, is it better? It possibly has less chemicals. We kind of know the chemicals that are being uh, brought in, but there's formaldehyde if it's, if it's hot enough and, and nicotine is just addictive and it has bad consequences. So it's another way of um, administering it. And, uh, so it's not the best tool. Oh, I'll vape instead of smoking. Well, you're, you know, you're still getting the issues with the nicotine. So, ideally, you wouldn't do either. You know, but sure. Um, looking at some lung diseases, we'll get to. Uh, but looking at cadaver lungs, this is emphysema in the middle. It has these big like uh, bubbles that come out. And this is a lung cancer, kind of white solid. It's kind of what they look like. But you look at cadaver lungs, you'll see smokers are just bluish black, you know, all over it. But even you know anyone living in the U.S. gets exhaust, and you're going to have some black blackness on the on the lungs. And lung cancer, um, you may smoke two packs a day your whole life and never get 
lung cancer, you know, but that's not an argument that smoking is safe, obviously. It's just a probability gain in some of his genetics too. But when you look at people with lung cancer, 85% uh, is attributable to, uh, to smoking and 30% of all cancers. So huge drain on society. And you look at deaths, you know, uh, how that can be related to smoking. You can see we, we look at 9-11 as being this horrific loss of life, but it's just a drop in the bucket compared to every year how many people die of smoking. This is old, old data too. Yeah, and half a million died of COVID over this last year. You can see about half a million died from preventable uh, illnesses related to smoking. And then uh, lastly, looking at simply, if you want to look at some kind of effect of uh, the environment, the best thing is twin studies, especially identical twins that were separated at birth, and then they live different environments, but they have really similar DNA, right? And uh, you can see the effect, the aging effect of smoking on the skin and on the hair, especially. That's just pretty obvious. You can see uh, uh, an older person and know if they have been smoking by clues uh, on their skin and hair. Yeah, yeah, certainly it has yeah, all kinds of effects. And there can be, you know, people say, oh, I smoke so they don't gain weight too. It's, it's true that uh, smoking dulls your taste so you don't smell as much. And when you don't stop smoking, things taste better and you eat more, but it's, that's not, it's not the good trade-off. All right, so obviously, so I want to talk about smoking and effects on the respiratory system. Um, actually, I'm not even done. We'll talk a little more about how, uh, how cancer is, is going to happen in the lungs and how smokers have much more respiratory infections because it paralyzes the cilia that normally clear out the lungs. And if you don't have those, you need to cough, and especially in the morning, you'll cough up all this stuff and there's more bacteria are going to be down there because you don't have this healthy little delicate cilia that are lifting up the mucus with the, the trapped bacteria. All right, what's with this painting? Beautiful painting. Uh, that's uh, Aphrodite uh, to the Greeks or Venus to the Romans, but uh, Aphros means foam. And uh, she is the symbol of uh, women, women and beauty and sex and, and all these things. And she, uh, in one myth, she appeared uh, on a scallop shell. She came perfectly formed like this uh, from the foam of the sea. Actually, Uranus, his, his son Cronus, cut off his genitals, threw it in the ocean, it foamed up, and then she appeared on the beach. Very colorful story, right? Um, but uh, she appeared, uh, every lung's perfectly functioning. And what I want, <laughs> this big lead up is just to let you know that of all the systems in your body, uh, the lungs, we don't test until birth. It's kind of dangerous, right? Before birth, long before birth, your heart is beating, there's, uh, your kidneys are working, electrical activity in your brain, all these things, uh, muscles are moving, right? But your lungs are filled with fluid <clears throat> all during gestation. And then we test it and it's gotta work. So um, that fluid comes out of the lungs, there's crying and coughing, and then you, <gasps> the lungs will inflate. Right, you gotta hope that they work. So all the other systems that you got going, you got them going before birth. But this one, once you go from that fluid environment to the uh, terrestrial environment, it's got a switch. No longer is mom's umbilical cord bringing you oxygen and um, your foramen ovale is gonna close off and your arterial duct. And so the shunts that took blood away from the lungs uh, are going to shut off so that blood is going to rush to the lungs, air is going to inflate them. Yeah, and we'll see, they need to be able to inflate. Uh, very important. All right. So, uh, respiration, you hear that, it has several meanings actually. Um, um, you think it's breathing, I'm, but it's also, remember cellular respiration? We had a whole huge uh, section on that last, last semester. Uh, that's where the cells use oxygen to burn sugar to get ATP, right? So really respiration is gonna have several events. It sounds like a multiple choice question here. Uh, ventilation is in fact the breathing. And we have a tidal flow. So air goes in and out. It's actually kind of inefficient because you always have dead air in your lungs, right? Efficiency would be an intake and an exhaust pipe where air went through, like, an, like, like a car engine, right? But ours, we have this back and forth, but it works. We refresh the air somewhat in our lungs with each breath by ventilating, primarily our diaphragm. 
Then external respiration is where we take uh, the gases in the air, we exchange it in the blood, and then uh, the blood will transport it. And then those gases, the oxygen, for instance, will leave the blood cells, go into, into the cells, into the mitochondria, and then we'll have cellular respiration is where we use oxygen and we break down sugar to get a lot of ATP, right? If we don't, we're gonna do anaerobic and get a couple ATP. We can, we can squeeze by with a few ATP, but you need to have proper respiration to completely burn glucose. And what comes out of it is gonna be uh, six carbon dioxides and water, right? Burning sugar gets carbon dioxide and water and energy. All right. So I love it. This is our body. And if you were a lobster, a crayfish, a fish, you have gills. And the gills are feathery because there are lots of surface area. And the water goes over them and the gases are exchanged. Well, we live on land. And so what invent was invented was the lungs. And so these are, we can't have like a big wet surface on our arm that we exchange. Yeah, it has to be wet for gases to dissolve and exchange. So we can't have these big wet patches on our skin for exchange. So we have these lungs, this wet surface that is made small. It's like the size of half a tennis court, like surface area. It's made really small by putting it in little tiny like grape-like clusters and we put it inside of our body. And so we bring this warm, sometimes dry air in and out and our wet surface is inside of our chest, All right? And if you're a flatworm or an amoeba, you don't even need a respiratory system. But, but we need it because all these trillions of cells in our body, diffusion is way too slow to bring oxygen deep in our body, right? So we need a circulatory system to carry those gases uh, deep to our cells you know, efficiently. Right? So once you get big enough, you need a respiratory system because diffusion is too slow. This is what we look like here. You can see our respiratory surfaces in our lungs and it's, it has to be wet. And then we simply bring gas and just diffusion. It doesn't take any energy at all. It's gonna move oxygen, carbon dioxide, right? With their concentration gradients. And at the heart of it is your circulatory system. Thank you very much. And that is going to deliver this, uh, these gases deep in our bodies to our cells. And in our mitochondria, you're gonna have our, our sugar, it's gonna be broken down. And because we have oxygen, we can squeeze out all the ATP uh, out of that sugar. So that's cellular respiration. All right, so you think you guys got it? Um, respiration here, we're talking about uh, delivering gases uh, deep inside to our body cells. And we need the circulatory system, we need blood to deliver it. But we're going to talk about how this air is going to reach that wet surface in our chest. And so it's going to be filtered and warmed and moistened. <sighs> you breathe through our mouth or our nose. We'll see how that gets back uh, down our windpipe, down into our lungs. Yes. And so today's lecture, we'll, uh, we'll do the upper respiratory system. We'll, do, we'll take a look at your nasal cavity, your sinuses, uh, down to your larynx or voice box. And then I'll see you guys in person. We'll, we'll continue down to our lower respiratory system. We'll get down to our lungs themselves. Yeah. All right, our respiratory system, of course, you know, looking at functions, uh, the biggest one is to um, deliver oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide, right? But um, smell, we, when you wanna smell something, you really bring that, that fresh air in, it goes to the very top of your, your nasal cavity where you're gonna have olfactory receptors. And then, uh, yeah, singing, yelling, talking, uh, speech. We're using our respiratory system for that as well, right? Blowing up balloons. All right, it's probably not the most important, but all these things, you know, respiratory system. All right. So your upper respiratory tract is going to be you hear about infections, they have an upper respiratory infection or lower respiratory infection. Upper infection would be you've got a cold, a sinus infection. Lower respiratory would be like bronchitis, pneumonia, something in your lungs, right? So it sounds more serious. If you keep things in the upper respiratory tract, if any kind of pathogens reach your lower, it's deeper, it can sometimes uh, take hold down there. 
But basic anatomy, you know what your nose is, right? Right there. Well, kids know nose, right? Okay. And then uh, your nasal cavity is going to be this space above your palate. I'm going to touch the roof of my mouth. I feel my palate. Nasal cavity would be above that. And then uh, sinuses, they're going to have or be these hollow parts in four of our skull bones, these sinuses. And then pharynx and larynx. So pharynx is going to be the back of your throat. And your larynx is going to be your voice box. So larynx is your Adam's apple, your voice box. And then your pharynx is the back of your throat, like up in your nose, back behind your mouth and down a little bit. And then we'll continue uh, later on looking at your trachea, which is your windpipe. It's going to branch into bronchi, eventually down to the in, deep in the lungs. You have a right and a left lung, right? All right. Fuck noses. The nostrils point downward because if you were in a rainstorm, they pointed up, they'd fill up with water. Uh -huh. yep. And uh, all kinds of interesting hypotheses about, about noses. Um, Anyway, our anatomy, uh, it's going to be, it's, it's bone here, nasal bones, but this is cartilage. You have hyaline cartilage. There's a septum, septal piercing, where kind of like a bull ring there. And you can get, you know, these other cartilages here, but you have cartilage in there with skin on top of it. You can see it's quite mobile up to you get to the bone up there, right? And I linked to an article looking at human noses and um, there's some evidence looking at different shaped noses around the, around the world, different races and different continents. But uh, there's some evidence here in this, 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 uh, this paper looking that um, if you're in a moist, warm environment, you can have big nostrils and you, don't, you can have a short nose. But if you live in really like dry, colder regions, the nose becomes more important to warm and moisten that air. So that nostrils get narrower, the nose gets uh, larger. So anyway, kind of interesting looking at uh, nose shape and evolution. Yeah, and then when you look yeah, right in the nose, there's going to be hairs right here that will provide a kind of a first filter of the air, right? But take a look the sagittal section in a human head, right? We did what's in this part here, that's the brain, we did that. And then uh, if you remember, we had olfactory bulbs in the olfactory nerve right there, right, right above that cribriform plate. Sound familiar? But uh, looking at that nasal cavity, you're gonna see these uh, nasal conche. The conche is a, is a snail, kind of looks like kind of the bone is, is curled around like that. You can have a superior, middle, inferior conche, nasal conche, or they're called turbinate bones too, because when the air is breathed in, you're gonna cause turbulence. You don't want the air like to go directly to the back of your throat. You might as well breathe through your mouth. But in your nose, the air is forced to, to hit the walls of this sticky, warm, um, wet uh, membrane, that respiratory epithelium with mucus. And it's gonna help filter the air and warm it and get it, moisten it. So looking in that uh, nasal cavity, I see those turbinate bones. I see my palate, both the hard and soft palate, separating my oral cavity from my nasal cavity. Yeah, and then we have a right and left nasal cavity. Uh, septum, you know, separates the two halves. And then as you go back, you're going to see the nasal cavity is going to meet that pharynx back there. So we've got this situation where air and food and drink potential to mix, you know, and you know, when you get, you, you breathe stuff down the wrong pipe, right? And you start choking and coughing. It's, it's a dangerous area there, especially if you're talking and laughing and while you're drinking at the same time, there can be some mix ups there. So yeah, I'll talk about that. The oral cavity is filled to this huge tongue. You can see that there. Yeah. And then looking to back, the pharynx is this back of the throat area. And again, this is this dangerous area where you have the windpipe and the esophagus right next to each other. And you want to make sure the air goes this way and the food goes this way. All right, here's these turbinate bones. Uh, again, also called the nasal conche. And you got a, a superior, really small, then middle, and then the big ones are the inferior nasal conche. And uh, this is looking straight at, this is a coronal section. See, I told you that last semester, we're going to use sagittal coronal transverse sections. But here's that septum. There's that wall that separates the right and left nostril. You can see that. And then looking in there, those conche are, you know, really curl around like that. Here's the septum. 
And as the air comes in, it's kind of goes through these meatuses or these holes that are narrow and hard to get through. So the air, it's harder to breathe through your nose, but that air is gonna be filtered as it goes by that sticky membrane because of that mucus. Ah, oh, beautiful histology. So here's the nasal septum, the wall in the middle. You can see some conche. Yeah. So the deal is it's healthier to breathe through your nose because the air is going to be more filtered than through your mouth. But you've all been there. You're gasping. You're going to breathe through your mouth, right? Especially if you're like uh, you're running in the frigid cold. You know, it's good to warm that air in your nose before it hits those lungs. But looking, you can see at the nostrils here, the hairs are going to uh, be a good filter for bugs, you know, big particles. So it'll stop it there. Coarse hairs in that first part of your nose. Yes, I feel my finger in my nose. Um, and that nasal cavity, it's going to be filled with uh, mucus and blood vessels are right next to the surface too. There's a rectile tissue in there too. It's going to fill up. And if you're stuffy, and you, you know what you're talking about when you can't breathe through your nose. But this warm, wet uh, membrane is going to help take care of that air, condition it before it gets down to the lungs. So it's going to add moisture to it. It's going to warm it up. And it's going to filter it because any of this dust and bacteria and crap will get trapped in that mucus. Oh, okay, yeah, one more style, histological slide. Just the red is bone. Look at how delicate that little bone spicule is. As is these conche of a different animal here. And then you can see this is that, that nasal epithelium, that pseudostratified columnar with goblet cells making mucus and little cilia. So as the air you know, travels you know, through here, this is gonna be warm and wet and uh, sticky. And so you're gonna have, the air is gonna be filtered and warmed up and you know, moisture added to it. Oh, just another view. Remember pseudostratified columnar? <clears throat> so there'd be goblet cells in there and uh, you can just barely see the cilia. And indeed, highly vascularized, lots of blood vessels right underneath it. And uh, uh, again, we studied this uh, in histology. We looked at, ah, here's some goblet cells, right? These clear cells that make mucus. And the cilia beat, they move, up. same direction, sorry, I'm thinking that and your nose will be going backwards. And then your windpipe, they're going upwards. So it's gonna trap particles in this mucus. Again, it's gonna contain pathogens, bacteria and viruses and dust particles. It's gonna get trapped in there and then slowly moved up and then you'll just swallow it. You know, you got pathogens, your stomach acid should kill most of those. All right, so as soon as we get in my nose a little bit, all that's going to be this kind of epithelium. It's going to be mucusy and warm because lots of blood vessels right there and wet and uh, nice. And there's an idea here, you can look it up if you want, about um, that in about 80% of people, um, your nostrils alternate right and left, like every few hours. They, they, they're congested and you, you breathe through one side or the other. I don't know, it's kind of cool, uh, cool idea here. Um, so we're not sure what causes this alternate congestion. Well, we know what causes it. You have that, like I say, erectile tissue. And so antihistamines help to, to, to get rid of the blood. But when they're swollen with blood, it'll close off one side. And there's ideas about letting the other side get, get moistened again while one side is open. Um, some idea about sleeping, it keeps you like moving from side to side to keep you, you might help prevent bed sores and from being in one position too long. Um, uh, there's been a lot of hypotheses, but that's something to think about is that you alternate congestion of your, your nasal cavities in most people. Yeah. But you've all been there when you have, uh, if you, well, your sinuses can be full too, but when you have nasal congestion, it means that antihistamines will help because histamine is opening up those capillaries and, and gorging those tissues. So, yep, but during colds, allergy, any kind of reaction you can have, congestion, you should know what that is. All right, nasal cavity. So we're past the nose, we're in there. Um, the vestibule is the first little piece. 
you know, a vestibule in a house is when you come into that first part, take your shoes off or in a bank where the ATM is a little vestibule. So that's what it means. And so if you look inside your nose, it's skin and hair. Okay. So you're going to see that a little ways. And then if you really stick your pinky up there, you'll get past that vestibule and you'll get to the kind of reddish, dark respiratory epithelium. But the vestibule is the part of your nose when you just look in there, it's skin. Skin comes from your nose and it goes in and it has these long hairs. But you know, the bulk of your nasal cavity is all pseudostratified columnar with mucus. The olfactory segment is gonna be up high, high, high. That's where you're gonna smell olfaction, yeah? And coming into it, this is gonna be back here, there's gonna be the openings that go to your, your ears, those tubes to your ears. And then if you look under here, you're gonna be an opening from your eyes where tears will come in. So you got your, your eyes empty into it, your ears empty into this nasal cavity. Yep. And you can see even with your mouth closed, or you're chewing or your baby suckling, you can breathe through your nose. Kind of cool. All right, I'm, I'm gonna uh, really briefly talk about olfaction because I did olfaction in the senses at AMP1. But olfaction is an ancient sense before vision or hearing where we detect chemicals in the environment. You know, critically important. Imagine you're, you're a fish, you can detect where food is or where a predator is. And so it's binding of chemicals to receptors. And, you know, we have, you know, this, obviously all estimates. Imagine we have hundreds of olfactory receptors and the ability to distinguish thousands of different smells, you know, and the professionals that smell, um, wine and perfumes, you know, I talked last semester how women generally have better sense of smell than men and how our sense of smell increases when we're hungry, yeah, all these things. Um, but, you know, this ability to detect all these different subtleties of smell, like I can tell grandma's apple pie from a store-bought apple pie, there are similarities, right? The apple chemicals, the cinnamon chemicals, the bread yeasty chemicals. So, what goes on again, and you can look at last, last, uh, last semester is that um, these olfactory receptors can bind several odorant molecules. And then we have a, our brains develop this matrix where we put together this combination of chemicals is gonna equal something in our minds. And so in this case, if it's apple pie, we put these chemicals together and we come up with the words apple pie, maybe emotions, you know what that means to you, hungry and uh, maybe. Uh, memories associated with that. but So we have this uh, olfactory matrix that we we build during our lifetimes. Yeah. And last semester I talked about how you should expose kids to smells and tastes when they're young because that's when our minds are plastic and we can really appreciate things in the, as adults. Remember, smell sensory adaptation happens really quickly. So you walk into Duncan and it smells like overwhelmingly like sweet, you know, whatever. But then if you work there, you know, if I asked you 15 minutes into your shift, you're like, I don't smell donuts. So you quickly uh, adjust. You live by pig farm in Iowa or you live by, like, by a garbage dump and uh, no one can believe you can live there, but um, you say we get used to it. And you do quickly, your, your mind ignores it. Yeah, and I mentioned the elderly lose their sense of smell. So they often put on too much perfume or cologne as well. And again, just reviewing olfaction being this primitive sense, cranial nerve one, right, is going to go to your limbic system, which is your uh, source of emotions and connected to memories. So you'll have a smell and you'll um, could have an emotional reaction before you even identify the smell, even if it could be subconsciously, you just, uh, uh, a certain scent is going to be important in our emotions. All right. And then just to remind you, pheromones, we talked about that earlier this semester, the endocrine system, um, are chemical cues that we smell um, that have some subtleties that are really cool if you get into that. Um, yeah, synchronizing menstrual cycles, you know, pheromones given off in a group of women. And then um, <clears throat> you think about, I think like a wildebeest in these, you know, nature shows how, the mom recognizes the kid, the little zebra kid, uh, uh, Colt, I guess, based on a smell, even though they all look alike, right? Um, and this one studies done with, with humans doing this too. And then, oh, it goes, it's so cool. And then women near ovulation, uh, a lot of things happen, uh, but um, 
One thing is they, they, they prefer men with different, remember major hist histocompatibility complex? We talked about that, like all Jeff cells, you know, are displayed in a unique signature. And so this, we'll be able to tease this apart, especially with mice, but even with, with humans, looking at how we prefer to mate with non-relatives. And so and this comes at a peak during ovulation when you're uh, the females looking to mate. And so uh, this becomes more, uh, sense becomes more acute. Anyway, some cool stuff you're looking at, you know, how important is smell to us subconsciously in, in our mating and such. We, we keep thinking vision and hearing is so important. Um, but uh, we have this basic uh, um, um, sense here. So bring, make sure you remember that. All right, and even your cat, you know, it is a better smeller than you. You look at the number of uh, uh, receptors they have and look at dogs, it's like an, another stratosphere, right? So they can uh, smell fear, they can smell drugs, they smell cancer, COVID, there's even an idea of being able to, to smell that. So these subtle chemical things that humans yeah, you know, can never smell your dog is really good at. All right, the olfactory region is up in the very top of your nasal cavity. And there you're gonna find uh, olfactory nerve one, there's a little bulb at the end of it. And then going through this cribriform plate, there's these little olfactory foramina where the nerves come. And then it's where the tire hits the road down there are the little hair-like receptors, hairs that have receptors on them for various chemicals that bind and they're gonna fire these things. And then your mind is going to put together what it means when these different neurons are firing, depending on what chemicals bind to them. Woo! Wow, it's pretty cool to break down smell, which is something we all live with. Although COVID, you know, some people lose that sense of smell and taste, that's horrific. Um, but other people that have toxins or head injuries can do that too. Um, yeah, it's not good to lose taste and smell. All right, let's move on. I'm uh, gonna talk about sinuses. Um, then we'll get down into the, the pharynx and the larynx and we'll call it a day. So your paranasal sinuses, which means, these are your sinuses in your head. That means behind, they're next to the nasal cavities. Um, we did it in the skull. So I won't take a lot of time here either. So you have really four bones we're talking about. Your biggest will be the maxillary bones here, the big sinuses here. Then you've got frontal ones up here in your forehead. And then some smaller ones in there, you'll have sphenoid sinuses, pretty big, and then little ethmoid sinuses in your ethmoid bone. So these four bones have sinuses. Um, and I talked about, when I talked about the skull, the purpose of them is to lighten the head. It makes our voice have a certain quality, like a guitar or a violin has a resonating chamber. So it does that. Um, Pain in the ass is that they get sinus infections because they're connected. I'll have openings into your nasal cavity. So infections can spread into your sinuses. They can fill up with fluid and cause pressure. Yeah. yeah. And the biggest ones I could say are here, maxillary sinuses. They're also the most difficult to, uh, to drain because uh, the other ones I'll go drain downwards. So gravity can help, but the maxillary kind of go upward. So often if you sleep, you'll turn side to side to drain those, but you'll feel the pressure here. But you'll feel pressure up here too, right? Yeah. Looking at here, I see, first of all, gosh, this is gorgeous. Looking here at the middle at the, ah, oh, you can see this person. I don't know the orientation of this, but it looks like they're, maybe their right side is clogged, their nostril, their nasal cavity. Because look at the, the soft tissue around those uh, concha on one side. So they're breathing through one nose, one nostril, definitely here. Cool. And then I'm looking at the big maxillary sinuses and you can see, I better go a different color. You can see here this, this fluid. Yeah, so you have fluid in the sinuses, right? That's it for sinuses, right? They're, they're hollow spaces uh, that drain into your nasal cavity. They're connected to it. They have the same epithelium. Yep. All right, I'll hear people pronounce this incorrectly, and I'm not even going to say it because I don't, just do not want you guys to even think it. But pharynx, pharynx, ink, ink, like fair ink. All right, pharynx. This is the back of your throat, yeah, in layman's terms. Um, so looking at this, hope you guys are getting this anatomy. You see, oh, look at that. We have that palate. You know, this is this is what makes what mammals have is kind of uh, unique that allows us to chew while we breathe. 
or suckle if you're a baby. And so you're suckling while you breathe. Otherwise you have to suckle, <gasps> breathe and go back to it, right? But we have this, this nose and the mouth and we can chew our food, which mammals do because we need lots of energy while we breathe, which an alleg alligator or a fish or a lizard can do. Mm. And so looking at pharynx, I'll show you that. I'll go back to black here. We're going to see it's this region. Yeah, there's your pharynx. So back of your throat. Um, yeah, beautiful. And then this is just a nice illustration. So again, realize this is your trachea or windpipe. It's kept open. We have this epiglottis, this little fold on top of it. And so normally you just breathe. It's kept open. Only when you swallow is that windpipe going to be closed. And then food or drink is forced down the esophagus to your stomach right below, behind it. It's just a nice illustration. I'm going to get there. All right, this is color coded. Actually, the pharynx we can talk about: nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeopharynx. Yeah. So nasopharynx up here. Remember your adenoids, are these tonsils up here. But this region here, oropharynx is directly posterior to your oral cavity, and then laryngeopharynx is this region uh, below. You can't see it below your epiglottis down there. So that's your pharynx. Yep. Um, again, some of this is dangerous area because you got food, you got air mixing, you know, you gotta, so you don't choke. And then if we follow the pharynx down, your uh, Adam's apple here, your voice box is your larynx, larynx. And then beautiful, this nice uh, uh, trachea. I can feel the rings going down, then it disappears underneath my sternum. And the trachea is going to come down and branch into bronchi, like primary, secondary, tertiary, bronchioles. So these bronchial tree is going to keep getting smaller and smaller, just like the blood vessels went from big to little capillaries. Same thing with the air. It's going to come down. Yeah. And we'll see, like the capillaries, the air moves wicked fast down your windpipe in the big bronchi. By the time it gets down to these little tiny ones, it's moving slower. So you're going to have exchange. So very similar. All right, larynx. Yeah, it's made out of cartilage, uh, mostly uh, hyaline cartilage, except for the epiglottis, which is elastic. So hyaline cartilage, you can feel that. My thyroid gland sits on top of it, kind of glandy there. And yeah, that's why I'm making these sounds. I am pushing air past these vocal cords. So here's a, a view front and back. So from the front, we have a thyroid cartilage makes up most of our, of our, our uh, larynx right here, thyroid cartilage. And you'll see in men, it is, in especially tall slender men, you know, have more of a keel, a keel right there. It's um, testosterone, it does that. And the larynx, the size of the larynx can equal the pitch of your voice. So men have deeper voices generally because they have bigger larynxes because testosterone works on enlarging those. So, you know, your voice will crack and change in puberty and get awkward. And then uh, they'll have generally deeper voices than, than women who have less testosterone have smaller larynxes. Yeah. But uh, in terms of cartilage, I think there's just, well, just three I want you to know. The thyroid is the obvious uh, right in front. And then right below it, underneath it, is a cricoid cartilage. It means ring, kind of like a ring underneath it. And so thyroid and cricoid, there's a little membrane in between one member in between. And let's look, let's look at the back side. So the thyroid was big in the front, big shield in the front. And the back, you see, it's kind of naked and empty there. See that? Yeah. And the cricoid gets bigger. It kind of comes up a little bit. Yeah. And you have some little ones that your book talks about. I'm not going to ask you about uh, um, the um, cuneiforms and the uh, arytenoids, things like that. But you know, thyroid, cricoid, and then the epiglottis we'll talk about. That's elastic cartilage. That's the part that flips over your windpipe, your larynx when you're um, uh, swallowing. All right. To be complete, this is showing the hyoid bone. Remember we felt that it's a little bit higher. So my larynx is here, the hyoid bone I can feel right here. It's bone and then the larynx is cartilage. All right, that epiglottis. That epiglottis, uh, it looks weird in this picture. You can see it looks like a, it kind of looks like a spoon, right? But that's just the cartilage part. In life, it would have, you know, you know, soft tissue filling it in. So I'll show you a picture. It kind of looks like that. Um, but this is what's going to stay up when you're breathing right now. But if I swallowed, it would 
it would close over my glottis, which is the opening to my windpipe, and the food would slide over the top to back to down my esophagus, which would relax and take the, the food. Yeah. So when we did histology in AMP1, we looked at elastic cartilage. And I might have been in an ear, but it could have been an epiglottis too. But so this uh, dark purple is elastic cartilage. It's your normal cartilage with a lot of elastic fibers. So it has to stay up. And I mean, swallow comes down and it snaps back up. So it has to have that snapping ability. Yeah. And looking at it, at the top of it, it's got to be stratified squamous because you have know, food and pretzels is sliding over the top, you know? But the underside is nice, delicate, that respiratory pseudostratified columnar. Yeah, so this animation showing uh, <coughs> your epiglottis up normally, and when you swallow, it comes down. And when you swallow, you notice if your, your voice box goes up, your larynx. Of course, I can't do it now. It goes up. It goes up, and the epiglottis comes down, and then it comes back up. So the epiglottis, if it doesn't come back up, it's, if you have a piece of chicken wing in there, you need the Heimlich maneuver, you're gonna be choking, right? So the epiglottis has to come up, stay up, unless you're swallowing, it goes back down and snaps back up. And here's a view of it, it looks, kinda of looks like a, a scoop or something strange, doesn't it? Yeah, there it is. And the middle's got that elastic cartilage. All right, almost done, hang in there. So, um, so what's on the inside of my larynx? It's my voice box. We have these vocal folds or vocal cords, you'll hear them called. And uh, really, if you look in here, you've got uh, a false pair and then a true pair. So false and true vocal folds. I thought they would, I was excited. I thought they would look like strings, like on a guitar or something kind of cool, but they just look like folds of tissue. Yeah. But they've got lots of fibers in there, elastic fibers, collagen fibers. And so when you push air real quickly, they vibrate and they make the sound. And um, the more tense, or the more relaxed, the different pitch of your voice is gonna be. And just generally how big your larynx is, how your overall pitch, like are you a baritone or a tenor, has to do with uh, your overall size. Uh, and then you can modify that, you know, what's your range when your vocal range by, by muscles and cartilage that will, will tighten those cords or, or relax them. So that's the key to us making sounds is gonna be our vocal cord folds or cords that we can change how taut they are. And it's gonna change the, the pitch of our, of our air that comes out of our, our lungs. And just to tell you, what makes the consonants and vowels is gonna be your, your tongue, your lips, your teeth, all these things are gonna modify the sounds. And remember Broca's area and Wernke's area? Broca's area is motor speech. And so as I speak, I mean, I have to breathe, I have to move air through my vocal folds. And then my Broca's area remembers how to make sounds. And then how, what, how to make words from those consonants and vowels. Ooh. Wow. So our ability to speak, I mean, the software to move my lips and my tongue it's, is, uh, is there. And then my mind works so quickly, it's sending the information as I do it. And how loud my voice is, is how much air I push out. All right. Take a look. All right. I think I mentioned that. Now this 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 video is awesome. Hold on a second, Let's take a look. Oh yes, yeah, just about done. I think I'll, I'll, yeah, okay, we'll do the rest in person. But um, you can take a look at this. But this ability to speak, I mean, you know, I put when I teach anatomy and physiology, I got to put it in context. Can't just oh, this is the human way. Well, we're the only mammal creature on earth that has language, spoken language like we do, and written language, I guess. I mean, you can talk to other animals and look at birds can sing and there's gonna be my frogs sing in the spring and there's, but you know, this ability to have this language and be able to pronounce it, you think, um, you know, gorillas and, and bonobos, they, they can learn sign language and hundreds of words like that, but why can't they, they speak, you know, or your dog, why can't it talk to you? You know, I can kind of tell you it's hungry. You know? So this ability to have speech, anyway, even Darwin uh, took a look at it, is, is, uh, has to do, uh, some of it is our big brain, you know, powering it, but then our anatomy is this dangerous mixture of air and food, because we have this long kind of area here, um, but it allows us to have this, this speech. So anyway, there's a, an article there if you, if you want to get into uh, uh, 
one thing about humans that's unique is our is our ability to have speech. Uh, let me see if I can uh, I can share this. I think I need to go to it. Inappropriate. It's just a okay. Hold on. So now I'm going to do stop share. I'm going to do share screen. I'm going to do. Uh, Again, I have no idea if, really if this is going to work, but if it doesn't, you guys can go uh, listen to it. Ooh, yeah. So if you're watching this, the way they uh, they they put this uh, a scope so they can watch your vocal folds, and they do this to check if you have polyps or cancer down there. But they put it through the nose, and it goes down, and we're looking. Look at this. Ah, it, makes, it hurts my nose, but we're going to see when they sing what, what the vocal folds look like. And they have one like with people beat, beatboxing or like you can, there's lots of these videos you can YouTube out there, but take a look at this. I hope you can hear it. If not, you got to go to the PowerPoint and play it. See the epiglottis is that little shovel everyone's got. And then you can see those vocal folds down there. to keep going but you, you get the idea so um you guys go ahead and um um well, i hope you it's just pretty cool to watch you know so this ability to have speech is about the respiratory system i'm pushing air out and those you could see in there the vocal folds tightening and opening and you see the the guy with the deeper pitch voices over here the higher pitch has to do with the uh how long and how tight those vocal cords are and uh yeah, and so um, the rest of it you're not seeing there is making the sounds as you know happens up here, really refining it. But what comes out of your vocal cords are the pure pitch sound with a certain amplitude or how loud it is, and then we modify it up here. All right, very cool. So introduction talked about respiratory system, talked about smoking, talked about upper respiratory system, your sinuses, your nasal cavity, your pharynx and the larynx, and so. In person, I'll, I'll, I'll be following it onto the lungs and we'll talk about um, uh, the volume of air that comes out and all you athletes out there. What's so important is, you know, delivering the enough oxygen so you, the blood can, can power those muscles. So we'll talk about capacities of your lungs, you know, among different people and breathing rate is a lot like uh, uh, heart rate. And instead of stroke volume, we're going to have tidal volume or, you know, and uh, you're going to see an, a normal breath is just like, half a liter, but you can take a three or four liter breath if you need to. So we have that really big capacity to, to crank up our breathing if we have to. All right, a little preview. And of course, we'll talk about emphysema, lung cancer, and asthma, things like that. All right, there you go. Little intro lecture, get us started with the respiratory system.